Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my 2022-2023 NFL Divisional Round Weekend predictions. Well, for the fanatic this week, after having a really good ending stretch of games to end the regular season, I went into the postseason like a lion, and I whimpered out. Very much like a lamb. Definitely a very tough first week of the postseason for me in terms of predicting, both against the spread and straight up. Uh, <clears throat> definitely not the week I was expecting at all of all the games that were being played. Um, last week against the spread, I went 2-4. and four. Against the spread and straight up, I went 500-3-3, three three, so I'll take the 500 straight up. But when you look at the whole weekend in general, you know, the worst game of the week was actually last night with Tampa-Dallas. That's the one pick I probably regret the most was Tampa-Dallas because I knew <clears throat> going into that game, the Dallas Cowboys had been the better team all year long. The Dallas Cowboys have been the better team all year long. But I just, after watching that game against the Commanders, seeing them score only six points and lay that big of an egg, I thought, okay, this is Tampa, this is Dallas. This is Tom Brady, who was going to, <clears throat> who was attempting to go for his 36th postseason victory, which would tie him with the, pa with, with the Packers and Steelers for the most all-time by a franchise behind the Patriots, where he got uh, 31 of those 37 victories anyway. With that being said, they ended up getting smacked around 31-14. to 14. Really wasn't even a contest. Dak Prescott played a sensational game. I think they said he became the 4th or 5th quarterback with 4 touchdowns and no interceptions. Or he had 4 passing touchdowns and a rushing touchdown in a single postseason game. By far, that was the best <clears throat> game of his entire career. Job well done, Mr. Rain Dakota Prescott, for getting your second postseason victory and showing that you are better than your counterpart, Kirk Cousins, which a lot of people like to call Dak the Black Kirk. So, congratulations for that, where, you know, the other the other loss I had straight up, Giants-Vikings, I can live with that one. That was a sensational game. Both ways around, but Kirk Cousins proved where Dak Prescott could still elevate <clears throat> over Kirk. Kirk Cousins still proved that he's still Kirk Cousins. He was 31-39, 270, three total touchdowns, no turnovers, had about 113 quarterback rating, played very well. But at the end of the day, the defense, Ed Donatel, former Broncos defensive coordinator under Vic Vangio, who was picked up by Kevin O'Connell this year, by gosh, does that Vikings defense suck like when you tried to blow on that horn of the Vikings. Um, blow on that horn of all, all the Vikings fans love to imitate. Ooh. Um, and shout out to Gio. No, sorry, buddy. That, that might be harsh, but uh, it, it's the truth. Because that was just, they were going up and down the field. Uh, Daniel Jones became the first quarterback in NFL history to have 300 plus passing yards, 70 plus rushing yards, and two passing touchdowns in the same postseason game. <clears throat> the Vikings really shouldn't even have had an opportunity to get the ball back because Darius Slayton on that third down play was running wide open in the middle of the field and he dropped the ball. And that should end the game there and the Vikings should have had another shot. Also, there was that really cruddy um, uh, roughing the passer that Dexter Lawrence got, which I call for a regular average hit so but i digress so you know that was brutal but every, what everybody's gonna talk about is also kudos to dory jackson held justin jefferson about six catches and 37 yards i think jefferson only had one catch and for four yards in the whole second half well on that first drive he was doing great and they scored that touchdown but then after that he was shut down the rest of the way through <clears throat> what everybody's gonna talk about is tj hawkinson who had 10 receptions for over 120 plus yards had the game of you know his postseason career for the first time, he throws it on 4th and 8, a 4-yard out route, and Xavier McKinney gets the tackle right where he, you know, he needed to be. He thought he was going to try to break out, and also there was pressure. But the Vikings, once again, continue to show <clears throat> that they are the Minnesota Vikings. And Kirk Cousins still for a 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. For an 11-year career, 
So it was a grand total of one playoff victory in an 11-year career. That's bad that his two ones by his career resume, in terms of length, are the same as his grand total of playoff victories, which is only one. So, but that game, I'm okay with that. You know, it's, it was a, I took the Giants plus two and a half. I, was, I hedged that bet. I was glad I got that one. <clears throat> and then, let's see, very quickly, Bills Dolphins. That was really bizarre. <clears throat> the uh, Buffalo Bills and Dolphins. The Dolphins should not have been in that game at all. But Josh Allen and them, boy, did he throw a lot of beautiful footballs. But boy, did he make a lot of mistakes at the same time. <clears throat> he got sacked seven times and committed um, three turnovers, but committed five with two other lost fumbles. Uh, he became the first t uh, team in NFL history, first quarterback to win a game, getting sacked seven plus times and committing three plus turnovers in the same game. <clears throat> Again, he was sensational throwing beautiful Gorgeous deep balls to Gabe Davis, Stephon Diggs, but it almost felt like that was all he could do. He really could not hit a, you know, a single or a good line drive double to cross analogy to sports there. <clears throat> and Skylar Thompson, who was very bad and did not complete a lot of passes, he definitely made some, you know, good attempts. And Jalen Waddle had his worst game, I think, as a pro in the postseason. He definitely left a bad postseason uh, resume starter to begin with. That was incredibly brutal. Um, and they had opportunities. They did get the defensive touchdown, the fumble recovery by Eric Rowe. But after that, that was just really not that, yeah, not that great. Um, but, and also again, I feel like for a lot of fans here, and you could disagree or agree with me, for Dolphins fans and Ravens fans, I think both teams will realize <clears throat> that the... If they had their starting quarterbacks, I I would even put Teddy Bridgewater in that conversation for Dolphins fans. Take take two out of there with his concussion. Uh, he's going to be back apparently in 2023. I'm, you know, I'm not that surprised, but I would, you know, I'm not going to give him his fifth-year option with his injury history. They're going to work with him on being able to take contact, which I think is a great thing because they a man should not be able to have three concussions in three months with the way he plays that position. But for a lot of Dolphins fans with Tua or Teddy, and Ravens fans with Lamar Jackson. J.K. Dobbins said it on a Sunday night, right after the game. I really feel like those two <coughs> those two upsets would have occurred if Lamar Jackson and Tua or Teddy were in those games. You know, for the Ravens' sake, look, we held Joe Mixon to 39 yards. Tyler Huntley actually had about 30 point higher ESPN QBR, not that the actual NFL quarterback rating. But he, would, he actually had about a 30-point higher QBR, and it basically took that decision by John Harbaugh with the botched QB sneak that I hated that we went over the top. In that situation, <clears throat> I always will pr promote pushing forward, not going over the top. I will always promote that because I think that's the smarter, safer option to make. But we did that, and then we watched... The longest fumble recovery in postseason history by Sam Hubbard. Very good defensive player. Very properly paid. A bit underrated defensive player in Sam Hubbard. Returning for 98 yards. And that was the difference in the ball game. There was a couple bad other penalties of roughing the kicker. Or roughing the, yeah, roughing the punter. Um, and the Bengals, I think after that, they went on. They had about another three straight three and outs after that. And even with that last drive, we had a chance. We got down to about the 25-yard line with a minute left. And John Harbaugh decided to execute some of the worst clock management I've ever seen. And even with that, on the fourth down play, the fourth and 20, after we got the holding call on Kevin Zeitler, you saw Tyler Huntley throw up a prayer that was deflected, and James Crochet literally had a hand under it. <clears throat> and if he was able to hold on to it, the Ravens could have at least tied the game, or I, I think they should have, they would have, they would have gone for an overtime attempt, you know, or to go for two for the victory. So, you know, th those were stories of those games. I really felt like that, you know, out of all those games, you really feel like for the Ravens fans and Dolphins fans, they know they played just as well, if not better, than their opponents. But if they didn't have, but the fact that they didn't have their starting quarterback due to injury, to, you know, different parts of the body, they got gypped at the end by tough coaching, <clears throat> bad clock management, and just inferior quarterback play. Kudos to Bills. Kudos to the Bills. Kudos to the Bengals. Job well done. You earned it. You know, cry over spilled milk. Whatever, you know, 
Dolphins fans and us as Ravens fans will do. But there was that. And then right before I get into my picks, I have to spend about a minute or two, ladies and gentlemen. I know, you know, there's not there's not that many games, so the picks won't take that long. I have to spend a minute or two on the absolute debacle. Out of all the losses I had uh, this weekend, the one that uh, sticks in my crawl the deepest and most frustrating is the fact that the Los Angeles Chargers, or the Chokers, and by God... You know, if there was ever a, a word that would describe a franchise, a uh, situation, or anything like that, the Los Angeles Chokers probably performed their biggest and saddest pathetic choke job in franchise history when they had William Trevor Lawrence. And again, like I said, I always tell people, that's his real actual first name. I, I'm not the biggest fan, so I never call him Trevor. I call him William. William Lawrence. Not through, not one, not two, not three, but four first half interceptions. Three of them were completely his fault. Okay? And also, by the way, Sonny Samuel, good for him. First NFL player to have three interceptions and a half for a playoff debut. Job well done for you, sir. You get the MVP for the defense. <clears throat> and then, but at that point, when you get 27 to nothing... Okay, and I knew they scored at the end, Evan Ingram. But I'm thinking, okay, they were up 27 at a point. Took one rule out to make it a 20-point game. I had very little, I had very little doubt that the Chargers were going to be able to hold on and win this game. And here's the thing: the Chargers are the first team in NFL history to have forced five turnovers, and they didn't, they didn't commit one. The Chargers did not commit a turnover the entire game, and over the next five drives, they went on a 28 to four or 28 to three run from being 27 to seven a 24 to three run to end the game and perform the third largest comeback in postseason NFL history and the fifth largest comeback in the entire league's history so think about it ladies and gentlemen over the past six weeks we have seen two of the five largest comebacks the largest all time Colts Vikings and Chargers Jaguars this year that is downright amazing that is about the equivalent of passing how like in the NBA with the three-point shot that you've had those insurmountable leads shrink down by the end <clears throat> um you know that 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 was just just stunning to watch uh Joey Bosa gets an honorable mention from me his hot-headed idiocy buffoonery his quiet stoned uh demeanor basically or his quite angry demeanor sorry cost him two big plays that gave him 15 yards and gave <clears throat> the jags the opportunity to try for the two-point conversion that they converted that the ravens couldn't from a qb sneak due to trevor being much taller and, and lankier than tyler huntley but that was bad justin herbert by the end of the game Really was missing a lot of great passes. He missed some big opportunities like Keenan Allen. Uh, <coughs> Cameron Dicker, the kicker, who only missed one kick all year, picked the worst time to miss a 40-yard field goal that would have forced the Jags to get into the end zone. There was a few dropped interceptions. Kyle Van Noy had an interception on that last drive that could have ended the whole game. But it's just downright an epic failure by the Chargers that should not have happened. Okay. And because of this, uh, today, the Chargers have also fired offensive coordinator Joe Lombardi and their quarterback coach Shane Day um, because of that fiasco. I know a lot, and, and, and I will be probably one of the rare people here, but at the end of the day, Brandon Staley, okay, for as awkward as he is, he can criticize the run defense, he should get a third shot, a third year. The players still believe in him. <clears throat> and the management still does as well. And think about it. He has the best offensive coordinator job in the NFL. If you if you were to tell anybody that wants to be an offensive coordinator, you get to work with Justin Herbert in his fourth year, by gosh, sign me up for that right now. This is better than any of the opening OC jobs that are out there. Tennessee, the Jets, the Cardinals, wherever. That's the best job to have for an offensive coordinator. The Commanders, that's the best one. But Brandon Staley made the playoffs. This was a Charger team that, again, like, <coughs> <coughs> I 
as much as there is a high expectation for what the Chargers, you know, people wanted them to do or expected them to do, they're still the Chargers. You know, I, I, look, I had them winning the division early in the year. I was wrong about that. But they made the postseason, okay? He's gotten away from the analytics, which I appreciate in a way because he's not making as many bad decisions that could have cost them the game. But he deserves a third year. And he's at, his mandate is clear. He has to win a playoff game. He essentially is the Mike McCarthy of the AFC right now. I know McCarthy's much better than Staley, but that's where his mandate is. It's not going to matter if the, Charger, if the Chargers have a losing season, have an above 500 season, don't make the playoffs. Even if they make the playoffs, that man has to win a playoff game in order to keep his job. Because at that point, for three years, with that much talent that you're going to retain, the offensive coordinator shifting, you are going to see, you know, the justifiable firing of Staley, at least next year. I think this year, it's okay. I would have kept him and made some other changes. <clears throat> but this Charger team will be good next year with Herbert, and they should be back in the mix, you know, moving forward. So, so those are my thoughts on, you know, all, all the games. Let me get into my picks. So, oh, and I just thought before I go into them, overall for the year now, through 277 games, against the spread, I'm now 133, 138, and 6. And straight up now, I'm 171, 104, and 2. That he, that he was at the 49.1% and 62.1%, respectively. I will accept that. I definitely don't think I'm going to get to 500, especially with the remaining. I, I know I have a chance because there is there are seven games left. We are in the final seven games of the 2022 NFL season, which is kind of amazing to think about, but sad. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to, you know, but at least I can maybe get to 500. I need, I need, I need five wins over the next seven It'll be interesting to see how it goes, but we'll see. So, uh, so but let me get into my picks now. So on Saturday, Saturday night, when the Jacksonville Jaguars go to Kansas City to take on the Kansas City Chiefs, the Kansas City Chiefs are eight and a half point favorites in this game. Give me Kansas City here minus eight and a half, and Kansas City straight up. Then the next game, when the New York Giants travel to Philadelphia, take on the Philadelphia Eagles. The Philadelphia Eagles are seven and a half point favorites in this game. Give me the Philadelphia Eagles here to win straight up, but I'm going to take the New York Giants. Plus seven and a half. Then the next game, when the Cincinnati Bengals travel to Buffalo in the highly anticipated rematch, just being in Buffalo now instead of Cincinnati, against the Buffalo Bills at home. The Buffalo Bills are five-point favorites in this game. Just like with the previous game, I'm going to take the Buffalo Bills here to win straight up, but I'm going to take Cincinnati plus five. Then in the Sunday night game, the last game of the divisional round, for the ninth time in NFL history in the postseason, the Dallas Cowboys are playing the San Francisco 49ers in Levi Stadium in Santa Clara. The San Francisco 49ers are four-point favorites in this game. I'm going to take San Francisco here, minus four, and San Francisco straight up. All right, it's time for my uh, quick thoughts on each game. The Kansas City Chiefs over the Jacksonville Jaguars. <clears throat> Look, this is the game that the Jags are incredibly thankful that they are in this spot after performing the 27-point comeback. Uh, Trevor Lawrence became the only the third quarterback in NFL history to have four interceptions in a playoff game. Gary Danielson was one of them, and I forget the other Bronco quarterback in the 80s that also threw four interceptions. But also, to be fair to Mr. William Lawrence, uh, he is also now only the second quarterback in NFL history to have four touchdowns at four interceptions in the same game. Even though, unfortunately for Ben, that comeback fell short against the Browns a couple years ago. This one was able to come through at the very end. <clears throat> um, I've, you know, I've been amazed by Jacksonville. So going from 1995 to 2021, the Jags won and 116 in games where they trailed by 17 plus points or more. That has happened to the Jags now five times this year, and they have a winning record of three and two, thanks to Doug Peterson and that staff for making those kind of comebacks in those massive numbers. Which is amazing to think about how much Doug Peterson and Urban Meyer. Doug Peterson is the literal godsend compared to Urban Meyer, who is the devil. That is essentially the literal difference <clears throat> of both those individuals and the coaching that has affected the whole team and William Lawrence's play. And we have a very big streak here on the line for both squads. 
amazingly, and shout out to First Things First for pointing this out, thank due to Nick Wright, William Lawrence, diehard fanboy, and irritating uh, jackal, Nick Wright. Uh, Tr William Trevor Lawrence, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't know already, throughout his entire high school, or Pop Warner high school, collegiate, and professional careers, has never lost on a Saturday. He is still undefeated on a Saturday. And this game is being played Saturday afternoon against this Chiefs team. But also here's the fun thing as well for the Chiefs. Since Patrick Mahomes has become the starting quarterback for the Chiefs, I think he's going to make NFL history. He's going to try to become the first quarterback ever that in his first five years starting to make five consecutive AFC title games for a career. That's an incredible achievement to think about. And also, just for that record, that means that Mahomes has been to four consecutive AFC Championship games. This would be the first time Mahomes, if he loses this game, will lose in the divisional round. <clears throat> um, it, and, but, but, but here's the big kicker here. Look, the Jags are playing of house money. This is a game that nobody thought they would be in, or, or nobody thought that they would give them a chance. They have a very much inferior roster. That pass defense is absolutely dreadful with the weapons that the Chiefs have in Mahomes, in Kelsey, in Scantling, in Juju, in Gray, in Justin Watson, with Isaiah Pacheco running the football. This Chiefs team should be able to get this victory against uh, the Jags in a comfortable way. Okay. Also, here's the other great stat that's going to really help the Chiefs' favor here. Andy Reid has been in the league long enough that he has played 31 games in his career, regular and post, with a bye the previous week. In those 31 games, Andy Reid is 27 <coughs> and 4 after a bye week. You know, the Chiefs team, they have. A lot of good defensive confidence coming to get, for coming from their last game against the Raiders. I think the uh, Jags' lack of an offensive line should, you know, be able to be a benefit for Frank Clark, for uh, George uh, Carafas. Um, I think Ward's going to do a good enough job on Kirk or Jones, and I just trust the Chiefs' backbone of the enemy and Spags, along with Reed being able to hold on and win this game in a consistent grind. Um, I also think this is also Doug getting to play Andy, and I think throughout their careers, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, Andy has never lost, Andy has never lost to Doug either. You know, I am kind of nervous because, again, the Jags are playing to pass money. William Lawrence has done a great job over the last several weeks. He's had the highest quarterback rating since week nine of the regular season. So I, I do think that, you know, if you took Jacksonville plus the 8.5, I could see it slightly. You know, just based off Andy Reid's previous history with playoff collapses, all the one and dones, and just the rust of, you know, and the pressure of Mahomes being this gold standard. But at the end of the day, the Chiefs are confident. They're rested. I think they have more, you know, healthy talent coming in. And I just look at the Jags and go, you've played well. You've had your moments. If Ryan Tannehill was in the games against the Titans, or in the... if Tannehill was in that second game, they probably would have won and probably knocked the Jags out of the playoffs anyway. <clears throat> and you just had the biggest comeback in your franchise's history. But um, at the end of the day, with all that, I'm taking the Chiefs here. Confidence at home. Moments never lost a divisional game. 27-4 up the bye. Number one offense in the league. Against the Jags pass defense. That through that first half. Was letting Justin Herbert just carve them up every which way. But twice on Sunday. And I think with the Chiefs weapons and the Chiefs confidence. I think the Chiefs will continue that notion. And go into Arrowhead and give the Chiefs. Or give the Jags. A very thorough beating. That was maybe kind of warranted. Or kind of foreseen. From the Jags Charger game. On Saturday. So. That's all I can City here. Minus eight and a half. Kansas City straight up. The next game, the Philadelphia Eagles over the New York Giants. This is one to wear. Think of Philadelphia. Rested team. More, conf <coughs> more confident. The Eagles have beaten the Giants more often in playoff games compared to not. I think Jalen, you know, he's getting a bit healthier. The Giants offense 
the Eagles offensive line should be back to full strength. And I just can't trust the Giants weapons. <coughs> Excuse me. Against this Eagles defense. You know, in both games. <coughs> the first game, the Eagles wiped the floor with the Giants. Didn't even really make it a contest. The second one, this is the thing why I'm taking the Giants was 7.5. With the Giants resting most of their starters, the Eagles were in a six-point game with Davis Webb and their backups as the main players on that squad. So, I do think the Giants, with confidence, with rest, with very low pressure, because the first time since 17, or you could, you could even argue the first time since 0304, the Eagles are have a lot of pressure on them to win this game based on the expectation, the talent difference, and how the Eagles have played basically the whole year, being pretty much unanimously considered the best team in the entire league for the whole season. It's tough playing a giant team that is well-coached, well-disciplined, and consistent in how they try to play good football. It's through run, play, action, Daniel Jones' legs. Also, Daniel Jones has a great memory in that stadium. That was also where he flopped on his face after that 70-plus uh, yard run. Um, but I'm taking Philadelphia here because where the Vikings defense has been bad essentially all year from the same point, this Eagles defense has been one of the best, and I think that they get a few turnovers at least get one or two turnovers on Daniel Jones. And I think the Eagles, with their run game, consistent RPO game, I think they grind the clock out, play good, consistent football. Hopefully the giant killer, Boston Scott, who has scored a majority of his touchdowns in his career against the New York Giants. I think he'll be a bit of a factor, especially uh, in tough goal line situations. But in this spot, give me the home team, give me the more rested team, give me the more confident team. And that's the Philadelphia Eagles, even though I do think the Giants with the 7.5 point pick I've made on the spread. I do think they keep it a lot closer than they did the first time around and keep it more like the second in Philly. So that's why I like uh, Philadelphia year straight up with the New York Giants plus 7.5. The next game, the Buffalo Bills over the Cincinnati Bengals. <clears throat> this is one to where I'm going to trust that the Bengals offensive line that's just suffered injuries to Alex Kappa and Jonah Williams, who uh, dis dislocated his knee once again. He's probably out for this week. But he could come back for the game against the Bengals or the Jaguars if the, if the Bengals make the AFC Championship game. But in this game, like with those three offensive linemen being down, I think the Bills' pass rush should be able to do well. But the other key thing, again, it's going to be the Allen turnovers. If the Bills' defensive line can make more pressure and cause Joe Burrow to have a nightmare in the pocket compared to having it the other way with the Bills, you know, with Josh Allen turning it over as often as he does, I'm going to trust that the Bengals' offensive line will be a much bigger detriment than Josh Allen's inconsistent and erratic play, especially with turnovers. You know, the Bills, <coughs> I believe, the, have the better secondary. The Bills are still the only team in the league that have been able to rush for 100 yards as a unit combined. Uh, for every game this year, or, you know, for leading the league. And I just think the other cool thing that I think the reason why I'm taking the Bills is if DeMar Hamlin, who is watching the game from his house, he's released from the hospital, if he can watch that game in the stadium, <coughs> that's going to ignite that crowd into a motivation and consistency that I just don't think the Bengals can beat. The Bengals will be incredibly happy to see Hamlin there. But, for the sake of the Bengals' chances of winning, I don't think that really will help at all. I think the uh, Bills here, you know, when you look at this, you know, this uh, Bills game, it's weird because it's like, everybody's going to be so focused on the DeMar story. But I, I think the biggest story to me is, can jo you know, because all the pressure's on now. Burrow, look, he's got five of the bank, five postseason victories, or four postseason victories for the Bengals. That's about almost as equivalent, if not more, than any other quarterback that franchise has had. Mahomes has won a championship. William Lawrence is in the second year. Josh Allen is in his fifth year with a new contract extension already back into his pocket, but it's just saying in this moment, 
we need you to beat Joe Burrow in this game that we never finished. I would actually even argue, I would love to see the score still remain the same at 7-3 to three and start from the mark there. If it's going to be a completely different game, I understand that. But, you know, when you look at this game, I'm going to take that the Bills and Josh Allen plays a less turnover-prone game then I think the Bengals will have Joe Burrow getting hit from his very weak offensive line. That makes a difference to me, and that's why I'm going with the uh, Bills here to win straight up. But I'm going to take Cincinnati plus five here because I know in my head Joe Burrow is a little bit better than Allen in a lot of <clears throat> in some respects, and I think the Bengals are going to be able to put a lot more focus into running the ball and uh, getting turnovers to help Josh Allen stay as limited moving as possible. So. We're moving up and down the field as possible. So that's why I like uh, Buffalo to win straight up at Cincinnati plus five. And lastly, the San Francisco 49ers over the Dallas Cowboys. San Fran's the best team in the league. <clears throat> best on paper team in the league. They have the quarterback seem right. The offensive line's pretty great. They have receivers and running backs and Debo, Kittle, McCaffrey, Juwan Jennings. Um... And all the other Niner assets. And I just think, again, like, the Cowboys are playing a bad overall Bucks team. That <coughs> the only reason why you took, why people like me and other people took the Bucks was because of Tom. Once Tom threw that red zone interception, the first uh, one in 409 attempts as a Buccaneer, you pretty much knew <laughs> that the Cowboys had all the control and moved forward and played a very sound and fundamentally consistent game. <clears throat> I mean, that's where I see the differences. Dak didn't have a turnover for the first time in about six weeks. I think he will at least have one or two against this D'Amico Ryan's defense next Sunday. This Niners team is more physical. They're more powerful. They're more consistent at quarterback play. I trust Brock Purdy's athleticism to be just as good as Dak's. And I just think, again, the Niners know who they are as an identity. And I just trust that consistent ground and pound with the play action over what I've seen out of the Bucks uh, tonight, or, or the Bucks last night. Um, <clears throat> you know. Also, I think when it comes down to it, because everybody's been talking about this, if it comes down to a kicking match, the Cowboys are a significant disadvantage due to how bad Brett the Friend Maher played. He became the first kicker in NFL history to miss four extra points in a single postseason game. And again. <clears throat> I'd be a little surprised if Dallas won. But Dallas has, I think, comparable offensive lines, comparable receiving weapons. Kittle's much better than Schultz is. But I look at this Niners team and go, better defense, more motivated coach, better running game. I believe Brock Purdy does not make another, you know, another big, bigger two mistake. I, I believe the Niners get this victory and head on to their second consecutive conference title game over the last two years so that's all i like to say for just go here minus four and say just go straight up and uh that is it so once again quick recap i have kansas city minus eight and a half kansas city straight up i have the philadelphia eagles and buffalo bills winning straight up but i have the new york giants and the cincinnati Bengals respectively covering and lastly i have the san francisco 49ers minus four over the dallas cowboys on monday night football in the week so that is it. So, until next week where I get my conference championship weekend predictions, uh, please check out the NFL YouTube prognosticators page or my description in my uh, video below. Uh, you have so many people like the Blind Canadian Cat, uh, Geo Knows, Bridgewater's Finest, uh, Fire and Brim Sports, uh, Half Moon's Picks, Sports Fan Entertainment, Philly Take of RB, The Raiders Report with Mitchell Renz. I have all those links there to people I've watched and find entertaining talking about sports down um, in my description below and that is it so until next week good luck to all players coaches uh teams uh any playoff fantasy football players and any uh daily you know or any sports betters out there so best of luck to everybody out there and until next week this is matthew and i signing off until next time everybody so long